So when we're looking at proteins, there are these fibrous proteins and then there's these globular proteins. And the difference is their structure. Fibrous means they form fibers, like hair, right? And these fiber proteins, what they'll do, fibrous proteins, they'll wind around each other. You see them winding around each other and they form these thick, these strong strands. Your skin is made of collagen. Your, your skin is woven together like cloth. And the cloth, the, 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 the material that the cloth is made of that you call skin is protein. So, and what attracts these together? What holds these strands, these polypeptides together? Together, these polypeptides form a protein called collagen. What holds these polypeptides together? Yeah? Hydrogen. Hydrogen bonds. It's always an intermolecular bonding. Because this long chain, you see this, this chain here that I'm, that I'm kind of drawing out here? Let me draw it out for you. Let me do it in yellow. This chain right here, this is a... That is a polymer of amino acids called a polypeptide. A bunch of them together form a protein. A bunch of proteins together, right? So polypeptide. A bunch of poly a peptides can form a protein. A bunch of proteins together can form a tissue. You've heard of this word tissue before? Tissue is when a bunch of molecules come together to form a functioning unit. Your skin is made of the tissue called, uh, what's called skin, right? Skin tissue. Right? But a bunch of different skin types of tissue come together to form Skin, the organ, skin, it's the biggest organ of your body. It's called skin. There's an epidural or epidermis. There's a mesoderm. And there's an endoderm. Three layers of, uh, that exist that covers your body. Each one of these can be broken down even further. And each one of these different tissues, this is all the organ, the organ that you call skin, is made of different tissues. So there's epidermis, mesoderm, and endoderm, right? And this is skin, which is, by the way, why, that's why we call a hypodermic needle is something that goes below what? Hypo means below, under what? Hyper, hypodermis, hypoderm, under the skin. Derm means skin. Endoderm. So those are the tissues that would be formed by this protein called collagen. And of course, each one's going to have different components, different structures. But the key is that you get the particular shape. You get this thing called skin because of the amino acid sequence that's in the polypeptide. Those R chains form specific hydrogen bonds that hold it together into this braid. Those braids are held together by cross-linking between the collagen, the braids are being held together, and that's what holds your skin together. That's what holds you together. There's these, these things that we've been learning about, these hydrogen bonds, these disulfide bonds, etc. So the interesting thing about fibrous proteins is they're not soluble in water, which explains why you don't just dissolve when you go swimming. That's a good thing. Because it would suck if you dove in the water and you turned into mush. Right? So we're lucky that pro these fibrous proteins are not soluble in water. They're very tough. They're stretchy. Again, very good, especially if you're a fat guy like me. Because if it wasn't stretchy, I'd rip. Right? So it's good that it... That, uh, 
that these proteins are stretchy. They're parallel. They form, they form these parallel organizations as sheets so that they can form layers, right? They form structural components of cells and organisms. Collagen is found in connective tissue. What do we call it, connective tissue? What, is, what do you think the word connective tissue means? Tissue that what? It's connected. Connects. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, science is not hard. It's, and literally, I know everybody wants to make it hard, but it's not hard. Collective tissue is, is tissue that connects. It's living, molec I mean, living cells that, that, are, that make up tissue that are formed of these molecules that hold together. Well, what kinds of tissues hold stuff together? Stuff like cartilage, bones, tendons, blood vessel walls, right? Anything that's, that, that's structural, that's making you who you are, right? Say that again. Connective tissue holds all that together. Yeah. Okay. Different, different molecules, right? Like bone is different from cartilage, and tendons are different from cartilage and bones. Each one has its own series of amino acids that give it the quality that they have, right? And see, that's the key, is you change the quality, of the, the, which amino acid you have where, and now you got a bone instead of a tendon. You change a little bit more, a few more amino acids, now you got cartilage. So now you got something that's more like a nose, right? Change a little more, now you got something that's more like skin. So everything, it, it, you change the qualities and you, of which amino acids go where, and you change the quality of what you're making. Yes? Collagen is an example of fibrous protein. Yes, ma'am. So there it is. Fibrous protein, collagen is an example. Correct. There it is. Now, globular proteins are slightly different. Globular proteins, they form what? What do you think they form? What do you think globular proteins form? Have you ever heard of the word globular? Globule? What is that? What's a globule? A globule. Say it again. All right, let's go back and think about what fibrous means. Fibrous means what? Kind of... Fibers, right? They look like that, right? Fibers. Things like muscle, right? Muscle would be like fibers, right? They're stretchy. They're, they pull back and forth, right? So that's stretch. So that's 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 not globular. So what's globular? So what's a glob? Like yeah, like a what? Like what? Like Flubber the movie? Flubber? No. Yeah. Yeah. Like Flubber the movie. Yeah. Globular is like what? Not a lot of good, not sort of kind of like a mess, right? Like a, it can have all kinds of shapes, but it's going to be, a globule is going to be like, it's a shape, but it's not a shape that you can define. It's not a sphere, it's not a, not a cube, it's not a straight line. So it's just kind of a glob, right? Now each one of these, could be a shape. This one, maybe this one helps you breathe. Maybe this one helps you do something else. So each globule, each shape is important. You saw that with hemoglobin. By the way, I'm telling you now in the notes on this recording, and I'm telling you now in class, I'm going to tell it to every class, understanding that hemoglobin molecule, it's going to be all over the test. So go over that hemoglobin, the primary, secondary, tertiary example that's in your study guide. The study guide is the guide that you need to use to study. All right. I think everything in science makes sense, but that's just me. Globular proteins, therefore, are different from fibrous proteins because globular proteins, they don't form fibers. They're kind of amorphous, but they do have a shape, but it's not stringy. So these, these molecules, they are easily dissolvable in water. You can find them in solution. That's good because you know where we find them? In blood. And what's blood made mostly of? Water. So it's really good that they're soluble. They're in cells. And what are cells made mostly of? Water. water. So it's really good that they're soluble in water. They dissolve in water. Water will dissolve them and let them float around. Yeah? Question? You can look it up on your previous pages. How do you smell what? 
I'm not going back. We're going to continue. I have no time left. Tertiary structure is critical to function. What's tertiary structure mean for a globular protein or any protein? What's tertiary structure? Primary structure is what? The order of the amino acids, right? The sequence of amino acids. Is it glycine, tryptophan, glycine, or is it tryptophan, glycine, tryptophan? The, the order of the amino acids impacts its function. So that's primary. What determines the primary? The gene. The gene determines the amino acid sequence. Now you have your amino acid sequence, you have your different amino acids all put together. What's the secondary uh, structure? Almost. The small folding that happens within a molecule, in the region of the, of the protein, the region of a protein. You can have many different shapes, very many different types of folding that can happen inside a big protein, like hemoglobin. Again, you can go back and look at your primary, secondary, and tertiary structure discussion. Then tertiary structure is the folding of the protein, right? Tertiary structure is how the protein folds. And in fact, how the po fo protein folds overall, the overall shape, that's what we're talking about. When I said that this, when I sat here and I told you that, let me draw this a better example, because this is kind of messy and it doesn't really look like like much, and it's hard to really visualize the difference between these. Though it is very much like this, the globular proteins are completely crazy in their shape. But let's take a look, let's make a real nice, simple example. If I do something like this, versus something like this, you can tell there's absolutely different folding, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can tell that this is gonna act differently from this. Right. If you were putting together a puzzle piece, you wouldn't put this into this. It would, they would do different things. So their shapes are very important. So when you tap that shape, that folding happens because of all the addition of all the different little uh, alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets in here, as well as the the disulfide bonds between the cysteines. And again, we talked about the example of hair curling or not curling because of this. Well, your proteins all over your body, either they curl or not curl because of this. And they determine, ultimately, they determine a shape. That shape is going to determine its function. What does it fit into? What does it turn? What does it do? It all determines on the big tertiary shape, the third level of shape. So the example they use here is insulin. Now, we covered insulin, didn't we? Those of us that went on the field trip, we talked a lot about insulin. Bovine insulin is cow insulin, a good source of insulin back before we, we could uh, make synthetic insulin. Bovine insulin is where we would get insulin, or pigs, we would get insulin from pigs too. Re relatively small protein, so small protein consisting of two polypeptide chains. So you see there's two here. This is one chain. This is another chain. It forms a specific shape. Mm -hmm. That's how this insulin works. Without, if you change this shape, this insulin won't work. Forget about it. It's not going to open. Now, I think you remember the medical students talked to you that insulin is like a key that opens a door in cells and lets sugar in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your blood glucose can't get into your cells. So your, high, your blood, every time you eat, your blood sugar goes up and up and up and up. Especially if you're eating things like sugar. Well, insulin is only actually very relative to hemoglobin. They're very small. If you go back and look at hemoglobin, hemoglobin is hundreds of amino acids long. This is not long at all comparatively. Two polypeptide chains, so two chains of, of amino acid sequences all connected together. One gene made this, another gene made this. And they come together to form a protein. These two chains are held together by disulfide bonds. Do you see them here? And that, those disulfide bonds, along with the alpha helixes, the secondary structure, and the beta pleated sheets, all make this shape. Now, if you can imagine, if you didn't have this cysteine here, if you had something else, it couldn't form this bond. And instead of this shape, can you imagine that you would have then something that looks like... You'd have that, but then this one 
would not, right, would not fold. So they would have different shapes, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So instead of having this fold here, if you didn't have this cysteine, you'd have this straight. That wouldn't work. You messed up the key. You won't open the doors. So people that have are insulin type 1 diabetics, maybe this is part of what's going on. Maybe their genes are born with a gene that their protein they, they make is it doesn't have the right form. If it doesn't have the right tertiary structure, it will not work. Yes. Uh, I thought insulin is one reduction. No. It's a good that's really wonderful that you said that. Thank you for sharing that because I know that that's a common misconception. You do not break down sugar. Insulin does not break down sugar. Insulin doesn't interact with sugar. Uh, the only thing insulin does is when, you're, when your pancreas senses that there's a lot of sugar in your blood, it releases this. It makes and releases this. Once it releases this into the blood, it, this opens doors in all the cells of your body except your brain. And it lets the sugar rush in. Then your cells break it down. We will break down sugar. It's called cellular respiration. We're going to go through the whole thing called glycolysis, and then we're going to talk about all the different steps of cellular respiration. You will have to know that for this, for this course. So we will break sugar down. But insulin doesn't break it down. It just let, takes it out of the blood and into the cells. Yeah. It's a really good question. What happens is the sugar binds the receptor on the pancreatic cells, on specific cells in the pancreas, and it's, it's, it signals to a calcium ion channel sequence, a DNA to start to make mRNA, which then makes proteins. Those proteins then are, are put into vesicles by the Golgi body and then released by the pancreas out, its, uh, out of its membrane. You don't know any of that yet. We'll cover that when we do protein synthesis, okay? But I answered your question. Yes? What did he say? Yeah, I know that. So you're, it's a great question. It just takes a lot. Do you see why we're building this information up, right? Because if I just dumped it on you, you would just freak out. I have students already that are freaking out, and there's no reason for it except that they're not going through the steps, right? You've got to learn, you learn each and every little step. If you don't learn each and every little step, if you don't, for instance, remember what an amino acid is, then none of this makes sense. If you don't remember what hydrogen bonding is and disulfide bonds are, then this doesn't make any sense to you at all. And now you're, now you're sitting there going, I don't understand. Help me. And I'm like, well, we have to start from the beginning. Because everything in here builds upon itself. All right, so anyways, enough of lecturing. Here we got uh, structural tissues of the body, right? I, I think you should be able to answer all of these, right? Give me examples. Uh, explain how proteins are involved in the following. Structural tissues of the body. How are proteins involved in that? Just give me one example, quick. I can't hear you. What do you say? Collagen. In what? Skin. Done. You can put some more and describe it if you'd like. Regulating body processes. You have one really good example a protein doing that. Say what? Regulating. So blood vessels, you're right, would carry the blood. So, but how do you regulate? It means you turn on and off. Oh, insulin that opens the door, that lets sugar in, right? Hemoglobin that carries oxygen. Those are examples of proteins regulating body functions. Contractile elements. You have, we haven't covered that yet. We haven't covered this. Uh, transporting, catalyzing. So a lot of these, we're going to be, I'm going to put this, uh, and I think you know what these means. Uh, what these mean to be announced, right? To be announced. Yeah. To be announced. You never saw this before. To be. To be determined. All right. So I'm be to be announced. To be determined. To be announced. Do we have to? Do you guys always have to nitpick everything? <laughs> Can't we just go with to be announced? Yeah, I guess. All right. Thank you. Explain the denaturation and the impact on protein function. Now, we did talk about denaturation, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about if we have a lot of... If, if I'm telling you that this shape is important and I put this thing under a lot of heat, what happens to this? If it, now, this doesn't fall apart because this, these are covalently bonded together. Mm -hmm. 
What falls, what breaks is what? Hydrogen the hydrogen bonds and the disulfide bonds. So if I, that's what happens in a fever. If, I, if you get a really super high fever, especially if you have it for a long time, what happens is the hydrogen bonds break apart and instead of having specific shapes, these lose their shape and then therefore they do what? Go straight. They go straight, they stop working. And what are these proteins doing? They're basic, they're regulating what? When, you, when we say body processes, body processes, what are we talking about? Let me, let me be clear. That's what body processes mean. It means life. If these stop working, you're dead. All right, that's what death means. You stop being able to process oxygen. You stop being able to process sugar. You stop being able to keep a blood pressure. You, you stop being able to, to conduct a nerve signal. That's what brain dead means. You're not sending signals in your, between cells anymore. This is what death is when these processes stop. Yes? So like in a hospital, or like when they keep in touch with somebody's heart rate, and like it stops and they just start beating, that's because they're... That would be one of the processes it stops. That's correct. Are we clear on this? So denaturation is just... Let's make this list and make sure you know, because it will be on the test. Increased heat... Increased or even decreased salt concentration. Acid, or let's, let's just say pH change. pH change. So increase in salt, right? Increase in salt is up arrow. Delta. Right, because he said decrease. That's what I thought you said too. Increase, let's just say, change in salt concentration. Square brackets mean concentration. Triangle means change. Triangle means change. This is called shorthand, right? Okay. How you, how you write, take notes and keep up. Change in salt concentration. Change in pH or pH change. Any one of these can, can affect the tertiary structure, the secondary structure, without impacting the primary structure unless you increase it a lot. If you increase it a lot, you're cooking it which means you're changing, now you're breaking up the amino acids. Now you're breaking this up. So you have to be careful. So how high will determine how much you change? If you're just changing the hydrogen bonding, you're not changing, you're not breaking apart the, the peptide bonds, then these changes can be reversed. If you break apart the, 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 amino, uh, the peptide bonds, you permanently change the proteins. There's a difference there. So pH change, salt change, uh, heat change, or uh, heat increase, all of these can, and why? Why is it that um, unfolding, that these, these will unfold it and not break apart the peptide bonds? The peptide bonds are what kind of bonds? Covalent, Covalent bonds. bonds. And they are what? Stronger, Stronger than what? Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. That was on your last quiz, right? So it's important that you understand that hydrogen bonds are weak. So when you do any of these things that changes that, you'll see that you can change the, 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 uh, the shape of it without impacting the actual protein. So this is important because what does it mean when you go into a hospital and you have a high fever, you're dying. Why are you dying? Because you've unfolded your globular proteins and they're no longer, they've lost their structure, their, their function. They're not working the way they're supposed to be working. Their shape is not correct. So what do you do? What do you do to someone who comes in with that high fever that has... How are you going to fix this cool as a doctor? Them cool them down. Ice bath. Put them in an ice bath. That cools them down, brings down the heat, that lets the hydrogen bonds form again. And the body starts regulating itself again. So really, this is the basis of medicine. When we talk about medicine, this is it. This is what all doctors and the nuances of this and the details of this and how can we can impact this, 
That's what medical school is all about. That's what undergraduate and high school is all about, is learning how this all works in detail. This class is an introductory class, so we're just talking about this in very general terms. So this is called, this is what denatures proteins. And yes, you have to retake this class. You have to take this in AP biology. You have to take it in college. You'll have to take it in medical school. If you're going to any life sciences, so more, the better you learn it now, the, more, the, the easier your rest of your career, the next 10 years is going to be easily 10 years. And even again, I'm going to say this again, even if you're just interested in being a lawyer, you're not interested in the sciences anymore. It doesn't matter. You have to take science in college anyways. Most people pick biology. Let's go on. Wow. So that's denature. Denature. It makes most, the most sense of the sciences for people. People generally think that it makes the most sense. Has also less math. That's another thing people don't like. Okay, can we focus? So denaturation and its impact on protein function. You should understand that if you denature the protein, you're unfolding it, you're changing the structure, so therefore you're changing the function. Structure and function. Why are fibrous port, uh, uh, proteins important to structural molecules both within cells and externally? Because what do fibrous proteins do? They're insoluble, so they're not going to dissolve in water. They're insoluble water, and they, hold, they, they give the cell and then the tissue structure. So just why many globular proteins in contrast to fiber proteins have catalytic or regulatory role. Because they have different what? Yeah. Different amino acids, but one, they're soluble in water, so they can be they can be they can work, they can do their job. If they're not soluble, they're going to stand in the outside of the blood, outside of the extracellular uh, the, the cellular fluid and they're not going to interact, right? So that's the whole point, is they're insoluble. They, like oil floating on water, they would float on the top. They wouldn't be involved in the water. So if you're going to be an enzyme, if you're going to regulate, if you're going to be, a, uh, if you're going to be an insulin molecule hormone, you have to be in the solution. You have to be dissolved. So one, globular proteins dissolve in water. Two, they act as enzymes because of their, specifically because of their various shapes. They're shapes. Fibrous proteins, by definition, are pretty much fibers. Their differences is how strong the fibers, how, how well they hold together, how flexible they are. Those are the differences among fibrous proteins. But they're all insoluble, and they all cross-link. Enzymes don't do that. They form these little globules that act as functional units because they have different shapes. So let me spend some time discussing molecules that contract. So you have this molecule called actin. Who's, who's heard of something called actin and myosin? Anyone? Nothing? Who's heard of muscle? All right, so what is muscle? How does muscle work? Well, what happens is you got this fiber, right? These filaments, these protein filaments, they kind of wind over like this, right? And you got this stuff that's called myosin, and it has a little head. So this is one fiber, and this is another fiber. Let me redraw this a little bit. And you, you know, do you have to know the exact what's what's going on? This is just an example of how muscles work. So there's this stuff called ATP that we use for energy. You'll learn about that soon. ATP is a nucleotide. It's a nucleotide, but we use it for energy. ADP turns into ADP and you release energy. 
When that happens, this little lever, if you look at the shape of it, what do you think is going to happen? These are two muscle fibers. Wait, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to rub against each other. It's going to pull it. It's going to ratchet. So you go clickety-click, clickety-click. And when you, use mu when you use ATP, when your muscles are working, this part here pulls on it, which moves the fiber in this direction. That's what we call contracting. So your muscles contract. All your muscles do is either contract or release, contract or release. Once they contract... If one set of muscles contract, that's why you have biceps and triceps. When, you, when, you, when your tricep contracts, your arm oh, moves in one direction. When your bicep contracts, your arm moves in another direction. That's all your muscles do is contract or release, contract and release. They don't push. They just pull. Yeah? Yeah. So this is what we call, these proteins are also fibrous. They are actin and myosin. They do cross bridging, and it's this kind of ATP use of energies is what allows you to move, lets your heart beat, lets you have bowel movements, it lets you walk across the the parking lot, it lets you blink and breathe. Yeah. Wait, what is actin myosin? It's a wonderful question. It's a little. It's going to take some time for you to understand this. But what what tells it what tells it to to contract or not contract is a signal from the brain, or from the center from the peripheral nervous system. It might be a, a a reflex. But in any case, you have an electrical signal, electrochemical signal. So there's a neurotransmitter, which is a protein. Which sets a signal. Your brain says, move. Your brain says, move. It doesn't have to be a conscious part of your brain. It could be another part of your brain that's, that keeps your heart beating. It could be another part of your brain that says, breathe faster. You don't actually think about breathing faster. You just do it. Or it could be you actually using the thinking part of your brain that says, run. I want an ice cream, run for that ice cream truck, right? Whatever. That electro electrical signal, ke chemical electrical signal gets sent from one cell to the next. This happens over and over again in your body. You just have like this domino effect. You send the signal gets sent to another cell, to another cell, to another cell, until it gets here, and that's sent to, your, to the actin myosin, which says go, ratchet, ratchet, ratchet. So all of a sudden you pull, and it's pulled tight, and then you say relax, and it relaxes. You say pull, and it pulls. Relax, and it relaxes. And that's what your body does. That's how it moves. Yeah. Wait, so that's, that's what like, we tell to move our bodies? Like when we say walk on the ground? Like we don't say walk, but like we just never walk. Yeah. Your, you, your body got trained to do that. Your brain trained your muscles to do that. Because when you were a little baby, you weren't able to walk. You, were, you probably spent a few days, maybe a week, Maybe a few weeks learning how to even roll over on your belly, right? I have hours of video of my niece on her back trying to roll over. My sister-in-law was a little crazy and just like videotaped hours of, and she wanted me to change it to DVD, and I was like, oh my God. Oh, you recorded the whole thing? She recorded it. I had to change it to DVD, and I was just like, this is it? That's all it was, the baby doing this. <laughs> <laughs> It was cute for like the first five minutes after hour five. I was like, okay. Wait, hour five. Hours. Uh, oh. Hour. I, I had to watch it to change it to a DVD. I had to sit there and place record and wait till it ends and then. It should have been like five seconds. Yeah. So is that what it means to be paralyzed? What a great question. Excellent, right. That's exactly right. What happens when you're paralyzed is this stops, the signal's broken. Like when you cut a wire, you can't, the telephone doesn't work. You've seen it in horror movies, right? Somebody cuts the telephone wire, and you're just like, oh. that's what happens in your body. Something happens, you cut the electrical signal to the muscle, 
your muscle's not going to contract because you you can't tell it to contract. But can't you get unparalyzed? It's very hard, and that's another story. Okay, we're getting off track a little bit. Yeah. Like that ATP is like Hold on a second. I got some kids in the back going off on side conversations. Go ahead. Like whoa, whoa. Why do you guys keep insisting on finding like the most? Let me see. I'm now. I'm allowed to wear white. Not allowed to wear outer jackets. I can wear. Can I wear white? No, I can wear gray. But I won't wear gray. I'll wear a white furry thing with a black undertone, so it looks like gray, kinda, but not. But is but isn't. I'll just push the envelope. That's what I'm going to do. Is that what goes in your mind, or do you just like pick it and say, "I'll see what happens"? <laughs> it's exactly that. You just do it and say, "What the heck?" Let's just throw caution to the wind and let's go and play it again. That looks great to you. Anybody else think that looks great to them? No. That looks white to me, with like. Black underneath it. Okay, let's just go like this. Let's just say this. I don't think that's dress code. All right. I'm not dealing with this. Yeah. So like, when you're building muscle, the ATP is disconnecting from the from the uh, like other muscle, and then it's like rebuilding. That's a great question. What happens is that when you break muscle fibers, you break this. You break the actin and myosin. And when that happens, more muscle fibers get grow to replace it, and so you build more and more muscle fibers. So when you exercise, you're, what you're doing is the fibers that make up the muscle snap because you push it to the limit. You have to push it to the limit, right? No pain, no gain, right? You have to push it to the limit to break muscle fibers to make the muscles grow. It stimulates the muscles by releasing hormones that... Things uh, that, that stimulate more muscle, say, that tells your cell, grow more muscle, and you start to build muscle. So you break muscles to gain more muscle. Yeah. You go through a series. You can't, you can't grow muscle without breaking it. Yeah. So the ATP is pulling really hard on the ADP. You have, like, a muscle... Like it's a really good... That's an interesting way. The ATP is just the energy source. It gives a phosphate up. The act, it's the... It's the myosin pulling on the actin. My, this is myosin. Let me be clear. This is myosin, and this is actin. Two different things. And myosin and actin, they pull on each other. It's ATP is the energy source. This is the energy. Think of it as lightning. But it's not quite electricity. You'll, you'll know more about that later. But it's a chemical reaction. It releases chemical energy, and it allows for the actin and myosin to ratchet. Like you know, I've, you've seen a socket wrench before. You know, right? That's what your muscles are doing. They're ratcheting, ratchet, ratchet, ratchet. Wait, so what happens if you have muscle cramps? It's a whole other story. It, it doesn't release. It contracts, but doesn't release. So you call it a cramp. So a cramp is just you 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 get the you get the cross bridging. There's a contraction, but there's no release. So and after a while, it becomes painful. Yeah. Why do you get cramps when you eat? Like after you eat. I don't know. I don't know if we know why people get cramps. I don't think it happens every time after you eat. They eat and exercise. I I'm not sure if the, anyone knows the answer to that question. Question. Wait. So then, what happens when you get the bunny bone? That's a nerve. That's a nerve. There's something completely different. It's not actually a bone. It's a nerve. It's a, called the humerus, the humerus nerve. That's why they call it the funny bone. Because non-scientists name these things. That scientist didn't call it a funny bone. Some person who never studied anatomy called it a funny bone. It's a, it's a nerve called the humerus. It runs here. When you hit it, it hurts. It, stimul it feels weird. I don't, it's not funny. It never makes me laugh. I don't know why people call it the funny bone, but except that it's called the humerus. And so people call it the funny bone because of that. It's not actually funny. If you ever hit it, you'll know it's not funny. All right. Moving on. <laughs> 